Hello, and welcome to Sundays at Coastal. This week, Pastor Andy preaches a sermon from 1 John chapter 4, verses 12 through 21, titled, There is no fear in love. We all struggle with something. If you struggle with fear, you may create a version of God that demands you to control every possible outcome. While sacrificial love can help you break down that persona, it doesn't necessarily make it disappear completely. You may find yourself creating another one. To truly overcome this, you must choose with Jesus to destroy that inflatable version of yourself. But how do we do that when we're afraid of being vulnerable with others? The answer is to choose love, which conquers fear. Perfect love drives out fear, and so we must choose, time and again, to be vulnerable and honest. As we deflate our personas and share our true selves, His love will continue to destroy our fears. Welcome, friends. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I'm so glad you guys are here. All those online, hello. Happy birthday, Nicole. That's our friend who had a birthday. I'm embarrassing her in front of her children. Uh, If you are new or visiting with us, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. It takes courage to show up to church uh, for the first time and, and or the second or third time and not know that many people. So welcome. We're so glad you're here. Uh, let me introduce you to what we believe as a church. We do this every week because there's some point in the week when we forget, and we, and we want this to be in our bones. This is a story that we see in Scripture. We see it in small uh, little stories, all three of these truths, and sometimes we see them across an entire book. The heartbeat of our church is Isaiah 61 which is the spirit of the Lord has rested upon us to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to set captives free, to give sight to the blind. And it's the same uh, calling that Jesus read when he was in the synagogue and he said, "In, in your presence it's been fulfilled. And the reason why that's our calling is because he lives in us. And he's bringing his kingdom come and his will to be done through us in our lives. And so Victoria, the preacher and opera singer, got to do that with Nanette. And we just I just love Victoria. And I also love Paul's face when he was trying to interview Victoria. He made my morning in so many ways. I love you, Paul. There is always, always hope beyond our brokenness. Always. It doesn't matter where you are in your life. It doesn't matter how bad your marriage is. It doesn't matter how how terrible your health is. It doesn't matter how much you're doubting God right now. There's always hope beyond it all. Always. Because what God does is he takes dead people and he makes them alive. Bit by bit, step by step, area by area, room by room that you let him in. Second, we get to trust in our risen Savior. Not perform, not pretend, trust. Trust is the act of vulnerability. It's the act of letting God in to difficult spots. It's the act of waiting. It's the act of praying and listening. It's the act of putting the weight of our soul on Jesus rather than on someone else or something else. Trusting is the best adventure you're ever going to have. It is absolutely terrifying in the best way possible. And it's full of joy and full of hope and full of life in a way that you never imagined. And third, we get to bring restoration. So we got to do that with Nanette. But we get to bring restoration to families in Guadalupe and, and to junior hires and, and senior hires who are allergic to church and who are never going to step through this door, but we get to love them back to life on Tuesdays. And the list goes on of how it is that we get to bring restoration and God We want God to bring restoration in your life so that you can then go do that for someone else. So each one of these truths has a choice attached to it. Again, that word, that phrase, I choose, weighs about 10,000 pounds in your life. I'll ask people for prayer. All right, would you like to pray about that? And they go, I guess. Mm -mm. That's a choice. And it's not I choose, it's I don't want to choose. That's also a powerful phrase. I guess, okay, no, 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 no. We're going to choose. We're going to make an intention, and we have a purpose and a direction and a velocity to our life. And so let's declare this and choose it once again, like we do every morning as followers of Jesus. 
We are disciples who walk intentionally with God. Therefore, I choose to be changed by Jesus. I choose to seek Jesus first. I choose to join Jesus in his resurrection The reason why that, that phrase, I choose, is so important is because it has two powerful words in it, I and then choose. And we're going to be talking about why, how it is that sometimes we don't even, we don't even get past the first word. We create this plastic persona, this inflatable me that's not me in an attempt to protect ourselves. We're going to be talking that about a lot today. But we're going to be finishing up 1 John chapter 4. I've been, I, I swear, every verse in this chapter is like spectacular. Read 1 John 4. You could just read it every day and you, you'll, it'll, be, it'll feed you for weeks. It's amazing. Uh, a- after this week, I've learned so much in staff meeting and then men's Bible study. I learned so much about this passage that I, I didn't even realize. Um, we're going to be talking about being loved. All throughout 1 John is the command to love people well, not thoughts and prayers, but to love them well with the same kind of sacrifice where we'd give up some time, some energy, some money, some, some interruption in our schedule for the sake of another person. And, and y'all like doing that. It's fun to be Santa all year round. I'm attempting the transformation, right? Uh, that's my goal in life is to be Santa Claus, right? I want to do this. Uh, but, and, and, and we gladly love people like with a love that just scoffs at the cost. It's like when you first fall in love, how much money are you going to spend on the on your soulmate. It doesn't matter, right? How much time? Please, as much as possible. How many, how many sleepless nights? I don't care. All of them. Right? Oh, you want to interrupt my life? The person I'm madly falling in love with? Please, it was awful before you. And y'all are loving like that, where you're really, you know what, what's happening here? Me loving another person is so powerful, I'm going to invest in them because they're precious, they're irreplaceable. And this is what we've been talking about, like, like how much does a soul cost, right? Jesus gives this parable, like, here's this pearl of great price, you'd sell everything for it, and that's you. He, he gave up everything for you. And what's incredible is that as we give up just a little bit together for the sake of another person, literally they get saved. You guys are amazing at loving well. Everybody wants to love well. I'll never forget, in my last church, we did a program called Stephen Ministry, which is a Lutheran deal where it trains people about how to provide care and be good listeners and caregivers for other people. 45 people signed up to be Stephen ministers, and we said, okay, who in the congregation would like to be able to have a trusted confidant and friend that they could actually talk to? Ain't nobody signed up. Why? Because we love giving love, but we have a hard time receiving love. It's hard to receive love. It's hard to let our guard down. We have all sorts of kind of crazy, stupid excuses. No, I'm enough. I'm okay. Somebody needs it more. I don't deserve it. No, not too much. It's like we're, it's like we're measuring the amount of mayo that you put on a sandwich, <laughs> right? The answer is more, always, right? Uh, maybe go, okay, fine. How much roast beef do you put on a roast beef sandwich? The answer is more, always, right? So like always, can I have permission to speak to your heart of hearts? Because I, I don't want to talk to the part of you that loves well. We, we got that covered. I'm asking to talk to the part of you that doesn't want to receive love, that has the inflatable version of you up front first and foremost. And guess what? That's everybody. We all do that. We all get scared. So I'm asking to speak to that part of you. So, do I have permission? Yes. Okay. Can we pray? Oh, Lord Jesus, help. Come, Holy Spirit, fill this place. Eliminate the distractions. Again, 
not today, devil, anything opposed to Christ. Get off of us and leave our place, this place right now in Jesus' name. For those watching online, leave, leave the home, leave the car, whatever, the beach walk, be gone in Jesus' name. Go to Jesus to be judged. This is your time and your space, Jesus, and we just pray your, your protection around us. Open our ears and our spirits to help us hear. In Christ's name we pray, amen? amen. Okay, here's the first mind-blowing verse this morning. Are you ready? Read with me 1 John chapter 4, verse 12. Here it is. No one has ever seen God. God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Holy moly. Slow down a minute, okay? No one's ever seen God. True? Yes, right? Kind of. People have seen Jesus. They've seen God, right? But like God the Father, like literally Moses got hid in a rock, and God said, well, you can look at like, you know, my robe, is it like, you know, like it, as I pass by, Moses' face glowed for 30 days afterwards, and people are like, dude, put like something on, man. You got a burqa or whatever, like cover it up, right? Because his face shine, shone like the sun, right? No one's ever seen God, but what does it say? If we love one another, God, holy bananas. When you love one another, the person you love, as you love them, they will see God through your love. What? Oh, I don't believe God exists. I can't see him. Uh Uh-uh. When I love you, you get a glimpse. How cool is that? You know what that means? Every single one of you have a purpose. Your purpose, no matter how young or old you are, rich or poor, disabled or fit, doubting or confident, retired or working, brand new Christian, seasoned vet, doesn't matter. Love one another. That's your purpose. Love well. Not thoughts and prayers, but love. Loving well. Giving your time, energy. When you love someone well, They will smell and feel and see and know Jesus. All of us want to make a difference. Yeah? All of us want to help. I was talking with a new friend this week. We went and prayed for a family. And um, mom and dad are there. Both kids are there. Both of them have this crippling disease, Huntington's disease. It's like uh, Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS, but the stop, start firings in their brain, start works, stop doesn't. So if they reach out their hand, see here I start, now I stop, Huntington's is just, this, it's just all start. So it's difficult to live with that. It's debilitating. Eventually you die from it. And this young man who's my age, he's young, he's a young man, <laughs> my age, he said with tears in his eyes, he says, I just want to help others again. And he was stuttering this phrase out. And as he prayed with me with his eyes closed, with us with his eyes closed, what he couldn't see is what his prayers were doing to his family. This is a young man who had not been with God for a long time. And there in that moment, he was opening this connection with God again. And everybody in that room was crying. And it was spectacular. It's Jesus. (laughs) He was helping others in the very moment of his weakness with his courageous prayers to take back his hope and to take back his purpose and to take back his faith and to take back his joy. We got to love him, and he was courageous enough to receive that love. And what happened in the room? Jesus is revealed. The glory of God literally fell in that room. The whole room was filled with the Holy Spirit because we got to love, and he was courageous enough to receive it. When you love and when you receive love, God is revealed. John continues with this encouragement. 
this is how we know that we live in him and he is in us. He has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If you ever wonder, am I doing enough? Am I loving enough? Am I getting it right? Take hope. God, the Holy Spirit, lives in you the moment that you said yes to Jesus to be your Savior. The Holy Spirit doesn't live in you only when you're praying or only when you're here. The Holy Spirit lives in you all the time. Your life is literally tied to the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul writes, in him we live and move and have our being. Sometimes the church uses grammar, which can feel confusing. We write songs or pastors use phrases like when the Holy Spirit shows up or when the Holy Spirit falls or when the Holy Spirit comes. And the grammar would lead you to believe that the Holy Spirit is not here, but if we pray, then the Holy Spirit will be here. That's our logical portion of our brain. And I want you to tell you that that's, uh, that's not accurate. But, but think of it this way. Have you ever had this magical conversation with like the love of your life? Maybe you're in a car ride, maybe you're eating dinner together, and then all of a sudden it's like everything just starts clicking, right? Or maybe it's like one of your best friends, and all of a sudden you're sharing, and they're sharing, and you're sharing, and they're sharing, and you find yourself in this pocket, and the distractions go away, and the murmurs of whoever's in the restaurant goes away, and the song kind of fades in your car, and you're just in this magic moment of connection. Have you had that? Like you pull into the driveway, and if you break this seal and open the door, then all of a sudden it's like all of your chores come rushing in, and that moment is broken. You know what I'm talking about, right? Or if like you're having dinner or like, you know, and someone like a distraction or something happens or a plate breaks or you fart, like then all of a sudden the moment is ruined. But I tell you what, if she farts back, marry her, right? Like, if, like that's... Soulmate material right there, okay? <clears throat> so once that moment, once that moment is broken, right, that person doesn't just disappear. You walk in the house together or you move on with your life together and you do things together, they're with you, yes? But that intimate moment, that connection, that conversation, that that time of just, you're just in the pocket together, that's no longer there. It's not, it's not what you're doing next isn't not important. It's just a different kind of experience. See, see what I'm saying? So that's what the church means when it says the Holy Spirit come or, or God, we invite you here to this place. Or, Holy Spirit, fill us up. We're trying to find language and grammar that would help us make that connection, that kind of connection, that intimate connection. God, the Holy Spirit, is with you always. God, the Holy Spirit, is your very breath. He's your counselor. He's the power that heals you and others as you pray. It's the voice that you hear in your heart when God talks to you. It's the one who is working through others and circumstances to bless you and to heal you and for your good. The Holy Spirit is is always accomplishing God the Father's plan to to redeem you and restore you and to, to help you know Jesus and then turn, turn you into his spitting image. Does that make sense? That's why John says, look, he's given up his spirit and we've seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world because that's what the Holy Spirit helps us do is understand the depth and the breadth and the height and the length and the width of the love of God so perfectly expressed in Jesus. Amen? So how how do you receive the Holy Spirit? Verse 15, read with me. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. Well, that's pretty straightforward. So do you want to receive the Holy Spirit? If you've done this before, you can pray it again. It don't hurt, but you, you don't have to like keep on inviting the Holy Spirit in because he's left, right? This can be a prayer of faith, but also if maybe someone's sitting next to you and they've never prayed this before, and it'd be sure helpful if you prayed that because then they wouldn't be alone in it. 
So if you want to, you can pray this with me. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. Jesus, I choose you as my Savior, and you are my God. Jesus, I want you to live with me right now. Holy Spirit, you are most welcome into my heart of hearts. Amen? I even got the typo in there, but you had ignored it. So that's pretty good. Good job. Listen, if you've prayed that prayer for the first time today, I want to talk with you afterwards. We have incredible gifts for you. We have resources to fan the flames of your faith. I want to talk to you. And I want you to know, if you've prayed that prayer, and maybe that's the first kind of prayer that you've prayed in a long time. You know, you know God, but man, it's been a while. I want you to know that Jesus isn't disappointed. He's not like, finally, right? <laughs> like he has been with you every single step of the way. He loves you. He adores you. Keep on talking to him and keep on listening to him. Uh, oftentimes we think that, it, that Christian, Christianity is like, well, this is elementary school, and then one day we'll graduate, we'll go through the ranks and end up where like Pastor Paul is, right, who speaks Greek at home with his wife, right, like, you know, it's just like got a doctorate, like we'll do, and I want you to know, and Paul, this is, Paul preaches this in his bones, we never leave this moment. The Christian life is always this moment of here's another part of my heart that doesn't yet believe that Jesus absolutely loves me, and so Jesus, I invite you in here, and then that part of my heart is healed and restored. And then there's another part of my heart that God will reveal in his time. And we invite this Jesus in. Please, Holy Spirit, come. I want you here too. The Christian life never moves on from this moment. The gospel is the only power to save. So if this is your salvation day, if you've prayed this prayer for the first time today, welcome home. Amen. Amen. So what helps us trust Jesus more? Well, it's not our performance. It's not our perfection. It's his. John puts it this way. And so read this with me. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. We know and rely on the love God has for us. This phrase, we feel like, man, God, John is just saying blah, blah, blah until it gets to the real part, which is God is love, right? Don't skip the first section of the verse. Might be one of the most important. <laughs> yes, we can pray for you. Uh, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. Do you know what this means? If you know and rely on the love God has for you, you know what that means your life is as a Christian? Your life is, your faith is about learning how to be loved. Parable of Jesus at the end of the time, Judgment Day, the sheep and the goats, you remember that one? Both of them did all the same things. Both of them confessed Jesus as Lord. The goats, Jesus says, away from me because I never got to know you, which means that they never let Jesus know them. The Christian faith is about letting God love you. And so the more that you receive love, the more love you will have to yeah. give away because you literally can only give what you have. I got nothing in this pocket, and I got four Tic Tacs in this pocket, <laughs> two for second service. <laughs> That's what I got. Now I have two Tic Tacs. Make sense? You can only give away what you have. You want to love well? Let me ask that again. Do you want to love well? Yes. Do you want to love someone so much 
that they literally feel, smell, see Jesus, then you got to let them love you. And we're terrible at this, man. And it makes sense why. The, The first reason is this. We shouldn't, we think we shouldn't be loved all that much. We limit our prayer because we don't ask for too much. Literally, in men's Bible study for years, guys would be like, hey, can you pray for this? We're like, absolutely. And then they're like, oh, man, I got one more thing, but like, that's too much. Like, we'll stay here all day and pray for you. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, you can have more. You can have more. And often we're like, no, 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 they need it more. We kind of think God is like overwhelmed administratively. <laughs> Just like working through the email. Stop praying so much. Good Lord, India needs my help now. <laughs> it's not how he works. You can pray as much as you want. Like he's not like overwhelmed. He's not like, oh, this is ridiculous. Ask for whatever it is that you want. Talk to him all the time. I literally have offered deacon help to these people in this church. They've lost their jobs. They're having medical expenses. Their kids are sick. Their grandkids desperate in need of help. They can't pay their bill, whatever it is. Like all these kind of things. And like, no, man, I'm white. I don't get help. Or no, man, I'm like, I'm upper middle class. I don't get help. Or other people need it more than me. Or no, 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 that's too much. They'll literally argue with me about get, getting money. And I'm like, that's not how it works. We have enough. And they're like, no, people need it more than I do. Nope, you're the only one who needs it. No, it's, it's too much money. No, it isn't. We want to give you more. They say, no, I cut them a check anyways. Take the money. <laughs> what is that? I, like... God's love isn't like a limited pie, and if you get a slice, somebody else doesn't, okay? That's called scarcity. That's not how the world works, right? That's not how God works. I shouldn't say the world. That's not how God works. It's a never-ending amount of love. It's a never-ending amount. The second reason why we're not very good at receiving love is because we've been wounded by others who are supposed to love us, and so even the very word love is tainted, it gets polluted. God's love is constant, pure, perfect, faithful, overwhelming, never ending. It doesn't stop whether you're good or bad. It doesn't stop whether you've been to church every week or you missed three in a row. It doesn't stop if you've prayed or not prayed. It doesn't stop if you've messed up or not stop messed up. It does not stop. It's faithful. God is love. He is never going to leave you nor forsake you. That's God. Other people, not so much. Right? We mix love with anger and conditions and selfishness. We withdraw it when behavior isn't met or expectations aren't met. And then what happens is that if you need love from somebody else and you mess up and they withdraw it, then how do you feel? Unloved. And then unwanted, that happens over and over and over and over and over again. Pretty soon you're gonna feel worthless. Pretty soon you're gonna feel like something's a matter with you. That whatever you do and wherever you go, you just, you can't be loved all that well. That's called feeling toxic. This is the, these are the wounds that we walk around with. Tony Campolo, the speaker and pastor, wrote this. Mixing manure and ice cream doesn't do much to the manure, but it sure ruins the ice cream. <laughs> this is what we do with love in this world, Right? We mix love with all kinds of things that ruin the taste and leave us broken and shattered. And then we make a decision, right? We make a choice. We come up with a strategy to avoid the manure taste, the wounds, and still get the ice cream, the love. And it goes like this. We create a persona to earn love. We create an inflatable version of ourselves that can perform and be enough to deserve love. We call it a mask. We falsely believe that our persona can receive love and protect us from pain, but personas cannot receive love, and all they do is project a mixture of performance, perfection, and worthlessness 
which tragically sets up the very conditions for us to be rejected and hurt again. So we have this inflatable version of ourselves, but it's inflatable. So if someone throws a dart of criticism at it, we step in front real quick, ah, take the dart. So all you do is get wounded and you never receive the love. But that's what we do. So here's what happens. This is what's crazy and this is what's terrible. Creating a persona is the strategy that we have as human beings. This is not a coastal community church problem. This is not an Andy problem. This is what we do as humans. So here's what's tragic about it. Are you ready? So I want to love you well, right? I get to love you well. I'm like, oh, man, I can't wait to get to know you. I get to love you well. And then I love you, and then I'm not loving you because all you put forward is the persona. So I love, but you don't feel it. And then you're thinking the same thing. I can't wait to get to know my new friend. This is going to be great. I'm going to love them so well. And then they, you love me, and then I put forward my persona. And so we're both loving things that can't receive the love. Does that make sense? So then how do you feel when someone loves you and you don't feel love? Unloved. So then you walk away going, I just... I guess I can't make friends. I, I'm, I guess I'm worthless because people say they love me, but I never feel it. Well, it's because it keep your personas getting in the way. The inflatable Andy is getting in the way, <laughs> right? Here, here's what gets really twisted. The persona, the inflatable you, has to be perfect. You have to perform, right? So then you try harder and you get exhausted. And you're like, I can't do this anymore. And somebody says, you know what? You're trying to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. Come to Coastal Community Church. There are no perfect people are allowed. It's fantastic. And then you walk through these doors, and you see all these smiling people, and you think, I, I don't think I could be this perfect for this long. And so you try. You really buckle down. I'm not going to sin for eight minutes. Oh, why won't this guy stop talking? Oh, my God. Oh, no. I criticized the pastor in my heart. I'm not perfect anymore. Right? We freak out. We're like, I can't go to church. I'll... Listen, man, you people are wretched sinners. Like, <laughs> your wives and husbands text me. They're like, oh, like, you cannot believe this. Like, I know all your stuff, man. It's terrible. <laughs> like, ain't nobody, like, the reason why most relationships, new dating relationships, end after three months is because that's about as long as anybody can handle trying to perform and not let anybody know that they're a broken human being. You know what's crazy? This is the awful thing. You'll hear from the pastor, God loves you. His love is faithful. His love is never ending. His love won't change. And your persona will turn to you and hiss the lie. God is love. And love is the demand for you to be perfect. So God needs you to be perfect. Otherwise, God will be angry with you and leave you like everyone else. That's a lie from the pit of hell, but this is what we do. This is how religiosity is born. Why? Because your persona needs a God, and that fake God demands that persona to be perfect. We all struggle with something. You struggle with worthlessness, the persona you create will create a God that demands for you to prove that you're enough all the time. You struggle with pride, your persona will create a God that will demand you to accomplish everything on your own. God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> Please, when you puppet that prideful persona, just you know, wash your hands afterwards because, whoo, nasty. If you struggle with fear, your persona will create a God that demands for you to control every possible outcome. Why do I say this? Because I've preached the gospel a thousand Sundays and still this freaking thing called perfection and performance hisses at me still. Why? Because there's still a part of me that is afraid that if you really knew me, you'd go, oh, he needs to work at Walmart. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with working at Walmart. Love me some Walmart. 
It's just that I'm scared. I'm scared that you'd shame me. I'm scared that you'd leave. And I mean, being a pastor stinks because people leave the church all the time. I mean, they move away. Sometimes they just don't like something in the church. So I, I've, for years it was like, oh man, why is this so painful? Because I truly love you. And at the same time, some of you are like, man, this is the last Sunday, and if he talks again about this rigmarole, then I'm out. <laughs> some of you might never come back, right? So I'm afraid. I'm afraid if you know me that you'll leave. Well, everybody's that way. There's only one thing that melts the plastic of personas. There's only one thing that destroys the fear of being loved, and it's the love of Jesus. It's his sacrificial love. It's you being loved when you don't deserve it. It's love that costs another human being, and you can see that cost. It's love where you cannot escape your failures, and, and you're not met with condemnation, but you're met with love instead. Thus John writes in verse 17, this is how love is made complete among us so that we'll have confidence on the day of judgment in this world. Read it with me. We are like Jesus. All of us need to feel loved by another person, to experience the love of Jesus through the words and actions. We need love with skin on. This is why we do change for a dollar. This is why we give generously through the deacon fund. This is why we do good things for each other. This is why we make sure that people in this church are actually loved. This is why we gather together all the time and eat and play games and have fun and walk on the beach. Is because you need time together to be loved by each other. And then when you're loved sacrificially by another human, me human being, it'll melt the plastic of your performa, persona. But still, still, you have to choose. Because it can melt the plastic of a persona, but then I can go, don't worry, I got a spare one. <laughs> but how can, we, how can we drop the whole thing and, and choose even in the middle of all that fear? Read with me loudly. Are you ready? There is no fear in love because perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. There is no fear in love. Don't mix fear in the manure, the manure of fear with the ice cream of love. Because with Jesus, there's never any fear with his love. We sang, the wrath of God was satisfied. What did God do when he was angry at all of the injustice done against you? What, is he, what does he do when he was angry at all the ways that you've terribly wounded another person? He paid for it. He died, not you. He satisfied his own wrath by giving his life as a ransom for you. He's the judge who said guilty, and then he took your condemnation for you. There's no fear in that. There can't be. He's eliminated it completely. When my son was six years old, he's 15 now, Levi was six, he's really struggling with fear. A good friend of ours said, play worship music in his room, it'll help. And so the first night, which we played worship music in his room, we were praying together, and I was hugging him, I was hugging him real tight. I said, I love you. And he hugs me tight, and he says, tighter. And I say, okay, and I squeeze him tight, and he goes, tighter, daddy, tighter. And I squeeze him real tight, and he goes, tighter. And he goes, oh, okay, they're gone. I said, what? He's six. And he said, Daddy, when you hugged me, I saw the bad guys in the room. And then as you were hugging me, black holes started to open up underneath them. And then as you hugged me tighter, they started freaking out. And then when you really squeezed me tight, they dropped through the black holes and disappeared. There is no fear in love. When you love, fear is conquered. When someone deflates their persona and shares with you who they really are, and you don't run, and you don't offer advice, you don't fix, 
but you just love them, fear is destroyed. And Jesus is revealed. Perfect love literally drives out fear. The Christian faith is to choose to be loved by Jesus over and over and over again. And please do not inflate your persona for him. He can see through it. He just goes, hi. (laughs) And we're like, no. And he's like, hi, I love you, not this. And so the choice to be loved, to know and rely on the love of God, to live in the truth that perfect love casts out all fear, is just the choice every day to be vulnerable with him in prayer and with each other. By the way, it does not work to be honest with God and then present your inflatable self to someone else. If ever you give that thing the ability to talk, it'll hiss at you. It doesn't like to give up that thing, that power. So pop it in Jesus' name. Do you want to? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, here. Here it is. Read, pray with this with me. Jesus, you loved me when I denied you. Therefore, the myth of perfection is annihilated. I reject my strategy of perfection and take back my honesty. Woo! All right. Are you ready? Here we go. Come on. Let's do the next one. Are you ready? Jesus, you love me when I can do nothing for you. Therefore, pride is pointless. I reject my strategy of pride and performance and take back my trust and humility. Oh, let's go. Come on. One more. One more. Jesus, you love me when I make horrible decisions, thus failure is destroyed. I reject the lie that I'm a failure, and I take back my confidence and victory in you. Are you ready? Can we do one more? That'd be okay? Just one more. I promise. That's it. Then we'll pray, because we got Chinese chicken salad waiting for you. Are you ready? Here we go. Jesus, you love me when I'm trying to control every outcome, thus fear and power and control are pointless. There's nothing that can separate me from you and your love. I reject my strategy of power, control, and the shackles of fear, and I take back my faith and bravery and patience. Amen? Amen. Fear has to do with punishment. He took it all. Fear has to do with shame. He bore it all for you because he loves you. Because he loves you. Because he loves you. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, seal this good news and this work in the hearts and lives of my friends online here today. Bless them. Protect them. I pray against every scheme that plans that the enemy has to rob, steal, and destroy what you've done today, Lord Jesus. Help us to receive love. Give us the courage to be vulnerable, Jesus. Lord, thank you for good food and good friends. Thank you for what you're doing in this church. Thank you for promises fulfilled today. Thank you, Jesus, that today was someone's salvation day. We love you, Jesus. And all God's people said, would you stand for the benediction? If you want to, you can head across the street. Table talk will start in about 15 minutes. Grab some food. Now receive the benediction. And if you want to, come forward for prayer as well. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance. That's his delight in you. Give you the peace that passes all understanding. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, go in peace this day. Pastor Andy Rock is the senior pastor of Coastal Community Church. It's located in Grover Beach, California and serves communities across the Central Coast. Join us online each week on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our weekly live stream. We also have two in-person services at 9 a.m. and 1040 a.m. in our sanctuary. Coastal Community Church is located at 1830 Farrell Road, Grover Beach, California. For more information, visit our website, www.mycoastal.org. Thanks for joining us, and I hope you have a great week.